Yes, and could you please identify yourself? I think we have a microphone that will be going round. Identify yourself uh, before you, you speak. Hi, my name is Stacey Hoyer. Oh. Okay. Yes, yeah, so our online audience. And I hope we still have Yusuf with us. I don't see him on the screen. Yes. Go ahead. Hi, my name is Stacey Hilliard. I work with FDL Development, and we specialize in monitoring evaluation measures of sustainability and C4D. And the things that stuck out to me most were the comments about the lack of perceived sustainability and the lack of M&E within the project, particularly with the partners. I was just wondering, with the M&E aspect, you mentioned you did a self-evaluation at the end. Was there any M&E that was built in throughout the project to have an ongoing M&E to make the program more flexible? Okay, let's take another question from the audience. Two more here, and then I'll also then we'll ask the panel to respond, and then I'll ask some questions from the online audience. Sorry, was it here? Yeah, and then this gentleman over here. Mm. Hi, I'm Simon Carpenter, British Red Cross. I wanted to ask, um, particularly about what Mark spoke about about the challenges uh, that that stem from two-way coordination around two-way communication around the the management of this sort of overflow of information that's often seen in, that has been seen in contexts like Haiti, this Disasters 2.0 report that OCHA did with the Harvard Humanitarian Initiative, which talked about that problem. And really, what, what the panel thinks about who should be coordinating this? Is this OCHA? Is this the Federation in terms of the Red Cross movement? Um, and how you deal with that? Because I know you talked about the challenge as well. Um, and Issa talked about the challenge around the hubs and how they were only dealing with project-based information mainly, so. Okay, thank you. And then this gentleman over here. <coughs> thank you. Uh, Greg Barrow from the, the World Food Program. I'm just interested from the panel to get a sense about how they found uh, within organizations the process of, of, of um, getting dedicated resources and capacity uh, for this kind of work uh, was undertaken. So I think that's a big challenge within a lot of these organizations. They'd like to do it, um, but it's not necessarily known who is responsible and uh, how those funds can be dedicated, because uh, you get the impression that to do it well, uh, it does need uh, dedicated resources. Thank you, and that was also a question from one of the, the members of our online audience. How difficult or easy is it to get donor support for these programs? So let me ask our panel to respond very briefly to these questions so that we have time to take a few from the online audience as well. Shall we start with Mark at the yeah. end? Um, to, is it Samuel's? Yeah. yeah, Sam's point about the, the challenge of kind of the it's the explosion of information, the volume that's coming from the affected crowd, as it were. Um, and there's a challenge around volume and processing it, but also verifying it uh, before you can even get to coordination and decision making around around it. Um, on the kind of uh, the processing and the verification, you mentioned the Harvard Humanitarian Initiative. That there seem to be sort of two streams of work at play. On the one hand, you've got the You've got um, you've got initiatives like the Harvard Humanitarian working to try and combine uh, human intelligence and machine intelligence to try and process information and look at look at whether it's actually sound and robust. There's a parallel need in the media sector, and you have groups such as Storyful who are providing the makings of verification services for mass media and, and trying to actually get a handle on whether information coming from the web, from social media is reliable or not. I, d I think this is, this is work in, in, in progress and those, those kind of workflows <coughs> are happening in parallel and there's an argument that, that actually there should be some interaction between them. Uh, on, the, um, on the issue of who should kind of coordinate and ul ultimately validate information, that's, that's more complex, uh, again, because of the capacity issue. And if you, if you sort of approach this as wanting information in one place and to, and to be kind of officialized, you, you start to run into major kind of systemic challenges. Uh, clearly, OCHA has, has a role in this because it does coordinate. It coordinates across the, the clusters. Um, 
but actually just to, at what point you can centralize decision making is, is very questionable. Um, I think my colleague Jacobo, has, our director of humanitarian, has done more analysis of this than I have, but I, I suspect that there is no clear and easy answer to that. I stand to be corrected by Jacobo, however. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Mark. Yes. Yes. Um, yeah. I'm going to ask Sharon yes. uh, if she wants to address any of the questions that have been asked so far. Uh, yeah, I missed question two, I'm afraid. I, didn't, I couldn't hear that one. This sounds like a bit funny. But the, the person who asked about the dedicated resources, um, yeah, that's obviously a, a big issue. Um, not every emergency is going to have the opportunity to have someone dedicated working on beneficiary communication. Um, big emergencies like Haiti or even Sierra Leone where it gets a fair amount of media coverage, clearly more money comes in. What the movement is, is looking at trying to do is equipping our more standard response teams like hygiene promoters or sanitation engineers with more in this area so they understand accountability, they understand how communication can um, increase their reach, particularly in hygiene promotion. So I think I think it needs a, a, a double approach. One, more resources for then also more training and support for other other teams who can take on some of this workload when it's not a big emergency, a big budget. Thanks, Sharon. Um, Richard, do you want to add anything briefly? Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm also going to come in on the dedicated resources bit, if that's all right. Um, mm. I think, uh, I mean, it, it is absolutely true, um, but that it that it's a challenge um, uh, to both uh, find and and um, uh, leverage sort of um, available or not available funds in terms of cash terms. But <coughs> there are lots of other ways, in my view. Um, I think uh, in terms of the actual cost of the hardware of, of, of any tech that's being used, this is relatively modest costings. Um, the big challenge um, that, that I know that, that myself and Merlin are facing is actually how do you in encourage um, uh, those that are writing, designing, delivering projects to include that as a core component of, of the work. And, and it's that expertise that is the, the 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 resource and the capacity gap that that we're facing. Um, one of the the huge advantages um, of being uh, a member of the CDAC network is that uh, we are able to access a lot of that expertise th through the network, through um, partnerships and discussions that that we would normally not be able to afford to. So there there are certainly uh, there's an approach there. Um, I'm just going to link up slightly with uh, the sort of the M and E and the, the evidence side of things. I think, uh, as we stand now, it is um, perhaps more challenging to go to donors to ask for dedicated um, communication, particularly technology costs. But the more evidence that we have that it delivers more efficient and effective aid, the easier it's going to be to to write in those arguments into our proposals and therefore the more the resources that are going to be uh, made available and, and the, the simple existence of the Infos Aid um, project is an, I an example or a, a proof that, that donors are prepared to invest if value can be shown. Thank you. Um, Carol, would you like to address the m and &E question in particular. Yeah. Yeah. Um, with every pilot project, we did discuss with the organization at the very beginning what the M&E um, processes would be. So we looked at the objectives, the indicators, and, and very really basic monitoring that we wanted them to carry out. This approach worked well with some organizations, not so well with others. Ultimately, the people responsible for this project were doing an, a job on top of their job already. So it really depended on the capacities that they had. And I think it's not a coincidence that where the monitoring worked best was in the World Vision case where the person in charge of the project was within their m and &E department. Thank you. Anita, did you want to say anything? Or maybe the next round? <laughs> um, I know we're already out of time, but I just wanted to, uh, to highlight a couple of the issues that people online raised. And then I hope that uh, at least some of you will be able to stay and join us for sandwiches and further discussion with the, the panelists who are in the room. I think, unfortunately, we've lost the connection to Yusuf, and we did have a, qu have a question for him. I don't know if he's back 
online, no? Okay, well, we'll pass that question on to Yusuf uh, um, by email, and perhaps he can, you know, we can transmit the answer to that. Um, let's see, I think it, and that was Hus from Husni, the senior communication information officer with the French Red Cross in Indonesia. He wanted uh, to have further information on complaint, on the complaint handling system that Yusuf mentioned. Um, I think it's uh, Luz Gomez Saavedra, I've probably massacred that name, uh, who is the humanitarian, uh, humanitarian officer for emergencies in Oxfam, Spain. Um, and has an acronym, M-E-A-L, which I don't know what that stands for, but has asked, um, do you consider information via SMS can be equated to outsourcing? Therefore, how do you deal with credibility and reliability of information? And how do we make sure the most vulnerable or discriminated against have access to communicating, are able to communicate? So that's, that's one, which I think is, a, is an important and interesting one. Um, Silvia Ferretti, who is an independent consultant based in Italy, asks or, or says, the fact that there are many disconnected initiatives have been mentioned. My experience in Haiti, for example, is that many humanitarian agencies had their own helplines. Nula, the Ushahidi in Haiti, was not used much as an aggregated source of information, but then agencies used subsets of the platform to collect their own, in quotation marks, complaints. And she says, what will it take for humanitarian agencies to use a common platform rather than their own? Another good question. Um, as I said, we've got so many here to choose from. And there's another one that asks about uh, ensuring that communication from mar marginalized groups, particularly women, you know, is addressed, you know, wondering how we can ensure that. This is William Sewells, who's a student at Queen Margaret University, Edinburgh. Um, and I think this issue around uh, that Carol, I think, mentioned in particular about uh, targeting women and making sure that they can participate. I mean, I think one of the conclusions that you drew was that women simply are busy all the time. And so how do you actually address that? I mean, it's a, it's a cultural and, and social and rights issue in, in some ways. And uh, the issue is to what extent can information and communication initiatives like that really address these deeper underlying issues? So that's quite a lot to, to deal with in our remaining time, but I think maybe I'll hand over to Anita first. Sorry, and it would help if you had the microphone. <laughs> so just a very quick reflection on um, reaching vulnerable groups. I think the key thing is that um, technology is not the silver bullet. Um, what we've always advocated for through Info is Aid was a multi-channel, multi-platform approach based on a very deep and nuanced understanding of the community. Um, so different members of the community will require different approaches. Uh, mobile phones may not work for the el elderly who have problems reading text messages, don't know how to use a phone. Um, or women who don't feel, you know, who've just been um, assaulted or sexually abused and don't feel comfortable calling up a hotline and, you know, speaking to a stranger. So it really is about understanding who you're communicating it, communicating with, what their needs are, what their preferences are, and then developing a, a multi-channel, multi-platform approach. Thanks, Anita. I'm going to ask Sharon if she wants to make a comment, particularly maybe on the Haiti comment question. Yeah, sure. It, I completely agree with Anita. Over the last couple of years, what is clear is that no one channel will reach everyone. Um, you really have to be creative and come up with lots of different ways. There's no one route to market. Um, in Haiti, for example, we find out through our evaluation that women particularly preferred phone lines. They like face-to-face -face communication. Um, so in terms of reaching women and the vulnerable for the, the NULA service and the camps that we, we offered the NULA service as a way of asking questions about the shelter program, we had a volunteer who always had a phone on him that someone could come up and, and take away and, and make a private phone call. So even if you know there was no credit um, or you didn't, I think at that point it was only accessible by one company, so we, we made sure that everyone could use it. Um, I think as well with the, the interactive voice response phone line, 
um, that's automated. So you can phone up and listen to um, really quite sensitive information without having to discuss it with a person. And when you look at the numbers of calls that we get to that phone line in Haiti, the automated one, one of the largest numbers of calls was about sexual health information. And we found when we were doing focus groups that people say, this is information we can't get anywhere else. We don't want to discuss it face to face. It's, it's very sensitive. So um, through an automated phone line is a good way to provide that without it, people having to feel exposed. Um, addressing the question about the, the NULA and the common platform, um, I, I agree, it's, it's, and we did use the information that came in general. I think you have to be realistic as well. In an operation the size of Haiti, with lots of different agencies, with lots of different programmes, there's no way that any one agency could assess all of that information. So our, our private page on NULA was specifically for our shelter program and for the, the WATSAN, so when we stopped providing water trucking. Now, some of the information that came in from that might have been confidential. We may not have wanted, and the person that may not have wanted that shared widely with anyone. So I think it's, I think it, it's, a, it's good that we share platforms, but I think it's not unreasonable that we also have some of our own systems to deal with our own programmatic issues. Um, I think that's probably it for me there. Okay, and, and I just wanted to to ask you, Sharon, uh, the interactive voice line that you mentioned, that was something that was developed with funding from the Humanitarian Innovations Fund, is that right? Which I suppose yeah, speaks yeah, to the issue or part of the issue of how do you actually get funding to, to pilot yeah. these activities or to develop these approaches. Yeah, definitely. I mean, the we first set up in Haiti, we had a very small IVR line that was provided by the phone company, um, but it didn't update it with information. It was something that was provided in the first sort of two months um, as, a, as a favor, really. So, and we, but we also had the SMS system, which we realized didn't work entirely well for doing surveys. So if we wanted to send SMS out to ask questions, levels of literacy, people not being comfortable with SMS, sending and receiving, meant that we didn't get the kind of response we wanted. So we sat down with the Trilogy team and we said, look, this is the issue. We want this. We want something that, that solves this issue of surveys, but also solves this issue of providing automated information that we can update very quickly from the Red Cross base camp. Um, they gave us the idea of IVR. We luckily found out about the, the HIF fund at the same time, and we developed with Trilogy a proposal for that, and obviously we were successful. But uh, yeah, I mean, I, I really um, echo what the people were saying about the pilots. It was very, very challenging. Um, it wasn't something that the Red Cross had ever done before. It wasn't something that really existed in Haiti. Um, so it was, it was quite a, a learning curve to get it set up. But the results from it have been absolutely tremendous. Um, over 800,000 calls since it launched in April of last year. But really importantly, about 50, 60,000 people have completed a survey. Um, we could never get that kind of feedback through a person with a clipboard. So for us, it's just, it's incredible the amount of feedback. We can also judge ourselves. So one of the questions we ask with the IVR is, is this information useful? So monitor it. The big challenge now um, for us is, okay, well, the IVR works. So how can we look at being able to run IVRs in other countries? a good option um, without investing the amount of money that we did in Haiti. Thanks, Sharon. Well, we're well over time now at um, 17 past one. And I think what I'm going to do now is, is draw this session to a close. I want to invite you again to please talk to our panelists who are here with us today after the meeting if you didn't have a chance to make your comment or ask your question. I want to thank the people who joined us online. Sharon, thank you very much. I know it wasn't easy organizing the logistics. And Yusuf also, who seems to be coming in and out. Um, and to thank CARE, actually, in Nairobi for hosting Yusuf and, and making it possible for him to participate. And to our very big online audience who asked so many questions. Uh, we only covered a fraction of those, but I hope that won't deter you from joining us in future meetings and also making contact directly 
with some of the panelists who have been with us today. So thank you again to Anita and Carol for a brilliant presentation, to Mark for, for joining us in those very insightful observations and takeaways from the report, and to Richard also for his observations on M&E and for giving us an idea of how this work might be taken forward through CDAG. So thank you very much. <laughs>